Thank you very much. I like the curtain. This is kind of like a television show almost when I come out and make the grand entrance. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come today. I, um, I may step to the side of the podium just to make sure that you understand. I, I want this to be as informal as it can possibly be. So I'm going to talk for a little bit about the things that they asked me to talk about. And then hopefully we can have a conversation. You can ask additional questions and I can give you the, um, the best answer I can think of as a government employee. First, let me thank the Clinton School and um, Skip, Nikolai, and Khaled especially for the introduction. But I'll also do what I do every time I speak publicly by thanking those of you who are veterans and or service members and or particularly Gold Star families. I think it's appropriate as a government employee that everywhere I go in the country that we recognize the sacrifice that people have made that allows me to have the job I have and allows our government to do the work we do overseas. And working in Afghanistan, that's especially significant and it's an especially poignant. I've lost uh, five civilians working for me in the time that I've been in Afghanistan. <clears throat> so um, the, the title that they came up with for this, and I'm always astounded at how creative and clever people are, from Georgia to Jalalabad, uh, a, a, a life of service. I'm not sure sometimes if Jalalabad's not a little bit ahead of Georgia, depending on what part of the state I'm visiting. Um, but I am a product of the state school systems of the great state of Georgia, and will do the best I can today to talk to you. Um, some talking to the college students who I have a particular affinity for, and then also um, answering questions from those of you from the community who have more perhaps substantive questions about what we're doing in Afghanistan. The working title though that I came up with on the plane in last night was I was gonna talk about me and you and the Washington Zoo. Because um, large parts of what I have to deal with with respect to policy in Afghanistan is constrained by and shaped by um, the, the engagements in Washington. And when I say the zoo, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense necessarily, um, but I do mean it very much in the sense that things are constrained. There are certain communities that don't work well with other communities, um, and, it's, and it's fun to watch, much like a zoo might be. <clears throat> where I am right now, and again, for the, for the students and for the discussion about how I got to where I am in government, I'm a career member of the Senior Executive Service in the United States government. That's roughly analogous, in my case, to being a two-star general on the military side, just so that you have some sense of, of where things stand. I work for USAID, the Agency for International Development. Um, we are not, despite the Secretary's uh, staff uh, admonitions to the contrary, we're not completely subordinate to the State Department, but we certainly work under the umbrella of diplomacy. My boss is the administrator at USAID, and she reports to the Secretary of State. What keeps us separate is one of those Washington uh, anomalies in that our finances for development come straight from the U.S. Congress to USAID. They don't go through the State Department. And that was intentional. They wanted us reporting to the Department of State for reasons of diplomacy and development and bilateral engagements, but they wanted us separate from the politics and the diplomatic quid pro quos that often go on. So our development assistance is straight from Congress, and my administrator reports directly to Congress on the money that she spends in support of development. So that's just one glimpse into some of the intricacies of how Washington works and why it does. Um, in terms of the, how I got to where I am, I was a very average person. I'm from a small town in Georgia called Stone Mountain. Um, I was a very poor high school student. I hated math. Um, one of the points that I made at the uh, conversation earlier over lunch with some of the students was the most important thing, I think, in uh, the early years of my career that I didn't know and that I would like to share with other people is, is watch for opportunities because they'll surprise you when you're not looking. Um, the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing today is because my high school girlfriend went to the prom with the wrong guy. She chose not to go to the prom with me, and I went promptly down to the U.S. Army recruiting station and joined the Army as a private in 1978 in a fit of pique. And I can assure you that about six months later, I was really wishing I hadn't made that decision because they were educating me on life as a young private in the Army. But that set me off on a career path that I would never have anticipated. Um, likewise, I studied physics and electrical engineering at Georgia Tech. I had no idea that I would wind up doing development work or diplomacy work, and yet that has contributed invaluably to my ability to work in this particular area. So um, my, from, from high school, I enlisted in the Army. Um, I was allowed to select into Special Forces, which is the U.S. Army's Green Berets at a very young age. 
They typically want you to be older and on your second or third tour, but because they were very short of radio operators, and I was a pretty good radio operator, I was allowed to go right into Special Forces. I spent 16 years in Army Special Forces. That gave me a whole set of skills and a level of confidence, I think, that I might not have gotten otherwise. Um, the way I moved into development work was they sent me as a Green Beret to Bosnia in 1995 when the peace agreement was signed there in Sarajevo, and I became an advisor to an organization called the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. Um, and that was my first introduction to what civilians could do in ways that didn't require weapons, it didn't require the expense of a large military deployment, but what the civilians could do to build nations or to build states. And I'm going to quibble a little bit about words as we go through the conversation today. Nation building is different than state building. In my, in my syntax or in my language, a nation is a group of people who identify as a nation. The United States is a nation. A state is, are the institutions that support that nation. It's the schools, the clinics, the hospitals, the police departments, the highway departments, the DMVs. The institutions of a state support a nation. So we had in, in Yugoslavia, we had a state, which was a Yugoslav state, that suppressed and combined six or seven different nations into one organization. And when the head of that state died, when Tito passed away, the nations exploded and it, and it resulted in, in a, a very ugly civil war. You could argue today that the Kurds are a nation without a state. They're a group of people who identify it as a common nation, but they don't have the institutions of a state, although PKK would probably disagree. There are some political parties who would disagree. Um, Afghanistan, very famously, has been a nation Throughout all their civil war, Afghanistan's civil war was never about breaking the nation apart. It was about who had the right to build the state that would support the nation. So I learned in Bosnia the value of civilian organizations working on state building so that institutions could support strong nations. And I think that was important then and I still think so now. But I went from the working at the OSCE in Sarajevo for about five or six years. I came back to Washington where I worked for a think tank where we talked about this civil military engagement and how we could work comprehensively together. Um, I took a job at the Department of State for a while in an office that was called the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, which was also an office designed to do exactly what I've been talking about. How do you get the civilian agencies of the United States government better engaged with our military colleagues so that in post-conflict reconstruction environments, we can bring a comprehensive sort of whole of government approach. Instead of the military basically trying to do everything, how do we get civilian agencies, and I might add local government agencies, how do we get mayors from very successful small towns to go to places like Afghanistan or Pakistan or Bosnia and advise the mayors of those towns about the kinds of problems they faced and help them build their capacity of their local government? Um, in 2001, uh, 2002 actually, I was asked to go to Afghanistan, as Khaled so kindly mentioned. Um, and stayed there for about five or six years, finishing up as the chief of staff of the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan. So the United Nations has a very large mission. It has 18 agencies that does quite a lot of work in Afghanistan, both in terms of humanitarian assistance, but also in terms of uh, governance and good offices, trying to negotiate um, healing the fractures in both the nation and the state of Afghanistan. Um, from the UN job, then I wound up where I am now at USAID. Um, I very much enjoy working for the U.S. government. There are days when it's incredibly frustrating. I have on my wall a number of pithy little sayings, one of which at some point in time is bound to get me fired. But one of the ones I like to quote quite often is, if this work were easy, the Boy Scouts would do it. I mean, I, I was a Boy Scout for a number of years, and Boy Scouts do good work all over the country. And if this were easy, it would already be done. We wouldn't have to have the United States government focusing the kind of resources and the kind of attention that we do on these parts of the world. Another observation that I'll make, and I think probably most of you, this will ring true to you already because you're here and you've, you've, you've taken the time and the opportunity to come and hear this presentation, but one of the things that I do when I go back to Georgia and talk to people is um, in, in trying to help them understand why we do some of the things we do around the world, I describe life in Georgia, in my small town, as living at the bottom of a well. And all I have in terms of perspective is what I can see straight up the well shaft. I can see a circle of sky, and anything that moves across that little circle I can see, but I can't see any context. 
I can't see anything to either side. And I'm comfortable in that well because I've always lived in that well and my neighbors live in the same well with me and we see the same patch of sky and we see it in the same way every time. So one of the things that I like to say to college students and to high school students when I talk to them is broaden your horizons. It may be as simple as going to your university in a different state than the one in which you grew up. Um, how many, anybody here Peace Corps volunteers besides the one? I, the Peace Corps is a fantastic way to broaden your horizon. Once you've gone to another country, and I'm not talking about Bermuda or Jamaica or Mexico, once you've gone to the other side of the world where they do things really different and they eat things that we don't eat, it's impossible for your mind to go back and forget that experience. And it reminds you, even if you go home to visit your dad in Stone Mountain, Georgia, and you settle comfortably into the bottom of that well, you now know that there's more out there that you can't see from Stone Mountain, Georgia. And that's one of the reasons I like to do these talks is because it introduces me to people all over the country who have committed themselves to broadening their experience and making sure that they are um, watching their left and right limits, to use a military phrase. They've, they've expanded their horizons and they refuse to go back to not seeing a bigger picture. Um, you know, I, I, I came prepared to talk specifically to students, and so I'm going to skim through this since we did a lot of this at lunch. But I, um, I don't think anybody in the age range from 17 to 27 um, is responsible enough to make a decision at that point in time and what they want to do for the rest of their life. My passion hit me when I went to Sarajevo and worked with the OSCE. I was 37 years old before I really realized this is what I think I'm going to be good at. So when I talk to my sons and talk to their colleagues about college, I tell them, focus on training yourself for the broadest possible range of possibilities. If you know that you want to be a brain surgeon or a doctor, that's great. Go do that. But for the vast majority of us, I think we need to be open to opportunities, to the serendipitous moment when your girlfriend goes to the prom with the wrong guy and you take some path that you would never have taken. And, and now we're in a unique position as well because the information technology revolution has allowed us to change the way we prepare for careers. My father had to know everything he could possibly know about being a, an engineer. He was a mechanical engineer. They didn't have an internet. People came to my dad as an engineer and expected him to be able to answer all the questions about a particular installation on a football stadium or a high school or a hospital. We don't have to do that anymore. We now have in our back pocket a computer that is more powerful than all the computers of NASA were combined in 1969. Your cell phone has more technology and more capacity than the entirety of NASA when we put men on the moon. So what I challenge students to do now is focus, you don't have to focus on knowing everything, you have to focus on how to use what you know. And what that means is social intellect, emotional intellect, and the ability to communicate well with others. You can have the best idea in the world for a development program in some country that desperately needs it, but if you lack the rhetorical skills to persuade me that I should put my tax dollar money into that particular program, it's a failure. So the, the challenge for students now, in my humble opinion, is to get out as far as they can, get out of the well, stop looking at a small section of the world and see as much of the world as you can. Now, while you don't have a mortgage, you perhaps don't have a wife or a husband or children, you have the opportunity to travel. Take this opportunity and broaden your horizons. You know, learn how to negotiate at a table, and I was talking about Afghanistan earlier at lunch, where not only do I have myself and the Afghans, I have the Brits, the Germans, the Scandinavians, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Russians. That's a really tough negotiating environment to be in. And if it's your first time abroad, you're going to be at a distinct disadvantage. So one of the points that I make when I give these talks is to um, focus on the things you can only learn at this point in your life because you have the ability to travel, you have your health, you don't have encumbrances that require you necessarily to be pulling in a paycheck every month. Train your mind to use the resources that you have as opposed to trying to memorize and learn as many resources, learn as many facts as you possibly can. The um, Wayne Dyer, who I quite like, has a really famous quote that I, um, it's, wherever you are, be there. And the point that he was making is that at, at a particular point in your life, you're not ever going to be at that point again. Enjoy what you can, get what you can from that moment, and put it into your inventory so that when you move on to the next moment, you're going to be prepared for it. And I think that's done me pretty well in getting to where I am. Um, 
Let me talk a little bit about Washington, and then I'll talk about Afghanistan, and then I promise I'll stop, and we'll do um, questions and discussion. The, if I were to characterize one thing about Washington that matters the most, it would be the, the, the phrase, pronouns are important. Um, now, when I do this back home in Georgia, I have to explain what pronouns are. So let me just say, when, when somebody from Washington says, um, we are going to do X, or I'll make it, let's not make it about Washington. When I'm in Afghanistan and somebody says, um, we are going to fix this problem, I always ask, who is we? I mean, there, you know, people talk, and you can even read in the press, the international community in Afghanistan is outraged at the latest affront to women in the country of Afghanistan. Well, no, they're not. There, there is no international community in Afghanistan in the sense that there, there's no phone number. If you wanted to call the international community, who do you call? If you wanted to send a postcard to the international community in Kabul, who would you send it to? I liken it to being in the business class lounge at Heathrow Airport. There's a lot of people there at the same time in the same place. They're all speaking pretty much the same language, English, but they're not all there for the same reason. They're not all going to the same final destination. And some of them are probably in competition with each other in one way, shape, or form, and they may not even know it. That's the same as an international community. When you go to Kabul and you meet the international community, there are all the embassies of all the countries represented, and they're not always going to be on the same sheet of music for the same reasons, for the same period of time. American interests are not always congruent with Russian interests, German interests, and French, and uh, any of the countries who are there. But what we have to focus on in these international communities is the, uh, where our interests do overlap and where we do find commonality, we want to really double down on those efforts so that we can make as much progress as possible and we can all report back to our ca capitals that we have spent our taxpayer resources in ways that are responsible and effective. But it is a huge challenge to talk about the pronouns of who is we, who do we mean. In the U.S. government, so I'm not unpacking Washington a little bit, the three branches of government, the two that are most relevant to me are, of course, the executive and the legislative. Inshallah, I won't have much to do with the judicial un until I'm old and gray, perhaps. But the, the executive and the legislative, and, and even in my short career in, in government, um, there have been periods of tremendous congruity where our, our, our intents were very much in sync with each other, and periods of tremendous um, disagreement where what Congress wants or certain members of Congress want is not at all what the executive has got us doing. Which leads to another point. Um, where you stand on an issue typically depends on where you sit in government. Um, if I were elected as a representative from the great state of Georgia for my home district, the 4th Congressional District, my primary focus is on my constituents, the several thousand people who voted me into office. Um, that's a very different perspective than a civil servant who's a GS-13, maybe the equivalent of a lieutenant colonel in the Army, and she wants to get her next promotion to a GS-14 by being the best development professional she possibly can. She's going to be very focused on achieving particular goals in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Haiti or whatever country she's in. Those two perspectives are both members of the United States government, and they are both doing the absolute best they can for the thing that they think is most important. But the we's don't match in that case. The elected representative's perspective is not at all like the development professional's perspective. Neither one of them is wrong, they just represent different constituencies. They sit in different places in government. The way that we try to reconcile this, at least on the executive side, is through something called the NSC process. The president convenes something that's called his or her National Security Council. Those are secretaries that, that she or he is appointed. And the National Security Council process flows down from that. There is a National Security Council which the President chairs. Subordinate to that is something called a Principles Committee, which the National Security Advisor can chair. Subordinate to that is something called the Deputies Committee, which is the Deputy Secretaries, and that's typically what I would attend. And then subordinate to that is something called the Interagency Policy Committee, the IPC level. And that's how government stacks up decisions. If we have a hard decision to make, the IPC level tries to resolve it. That's all the agencies of the U.S. government. Those, those meetings can be 
this many people or maybe a small group meeting of just five or six. It depends on the question. But if there's a question to be resolved among the different agencies, you do it at the IPC level if you can. And then they report up to the deputies committee and the deputies report to the principals committee. And if necessary, it goes to the National Security Council and the president. But even then, there are people who are not in that circle. The NSC process is rewritten by every president when they're elected. That's usually their first presidential decision, is this is how my National Security Council will work. And they can't include everybody. For one thing, you have to have a very high level of security clearance to get into NSC meetings, because they may talk about very classified things. But there's just people that are left outside the tent. So again, the pronouns are important. There are some incredibly smart, incredibly passionate, and incredibly talented people in Washington who are not part of government, but they're often not involved in these kinds of discussions and decisions. So the pronouns are, again, important. Now, an, uh, an optimistic point, and then I think I'll stop. Um, a, a book recommendation, if you haven't read it, is a book called Victory on the Potomac. It's written by a guy named Jim Walker, um, and it's the story of Goldwater and Nichols Act and if you don't know the Goldwater Nichols Act, it's how we took the various, the five military services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard, and created a joint military strategy, a joint military organization. Um, it's, it reads like a novel. Most books written about Washington I wouldn't recommend because, to be honest, I wouldn't read them myself. But this one is a really entertaining book. Jim Walker was a congressional staffer working on Goldwater Nichols and Sam Nunn's staff. And he was very much involved in crafting legislation that would take the, the very separate and very detached and, in fact, very combative military services and combine them into one joint military. Um, I, I came into the military kind of at the tail end of that, and I remember the animosity and the disdain that a lot of military officers had for this joint process. It meant, for example, that Marines had to go train in Army colleges. And Army soldiers had to go to the Air Force uh, trainings uh, and, and education. It was not very well received. But I can say with confidence that now some 20 or 30 years later, it has produced a military that is capable of joint operations. We haven't done that for the rest of government. So the, the thing that I, I have optimism and hope for, Jim Walker is still around. He'd be a great speaker, wherever Dimitri is. If, uh, some days you want to have somebody who can talk in great depth about how we do comprehensive work, Jim Locker is still working on the same project. He has a project called Project for National Security Reform, which is a recognition that it's no longer enough to militarily win wars. We also have to win the peace that follows the war. And the military can't do all that. And so Jim Locker, this Project for National Security Reform, is a recognition of that. And it's an attempt to reorganize in Washington the civil and the military structures that govern how we manage these conflicts so that we can perhaps do a better job of them. And that's probably a good way to stop and to segue into discussions of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, I don't, uh, I, I will talk until somebody raises your hand if you have a question. If I get really desperate, I'll burst into song and you really don't want that. So somebody please ask a question. Yes, sir, we got a question right here. Wait for the microphone right there, please. Okay. My question, uh, I guess, relates a little bit to your definition of nation. Um, oftentimes, we don't perhaps think of Afghanistan as a nation. So, you know, you mentioned the Kurds in Iraq as a nation. So, I guess, uh, and, and some people feel that Afghanistan could sort of break apart, you know, without too much. What about the tribes? You know, we, some people would view the tribes more like nations. So when you said Afghanistan is a nation, what's the unifying part that makes them a nation? Great question. Um, and I'm really conscious of the fact that I have an Afghan expert sitting over here, um, Khaled. So um, rhetorically, kick me under the table if I get this wrong. In, in my experience working with Afghanistan, I would call them a nation because um, the, the Hazaras are a particular tribe in Afghanistan that are uh, Shia Muslims, not Sunni Muslims. And Iran had offered the Hazara tribesmen succor and support during the conflict, during the period of the war. Iran had said, hey, we got your back. We're happy to pitch in. And the Hazaras famously said, and I'm, I'm generalizing here because all Hazaras didn't say anything. The leaders of the Hazara community said, no, this is an Afghan problem. We, we do not want... We, the Shia of Afghanistan, do not want our affinity to be to Iran. We want it to be to Afghanistan. 
I think what you're recognizing quite accurately in Afghanistan is the primacy of tribal affiliations. There is a saying that I almost certainly will butcher, which is something like me against my brother, me and my brother against my cousin, me and my cousin against the community, and me and my community against the world. The, the point is the loyalties in Afghanistan are, are clan-based and then tribe-based. Um, and, and that's the challenge that the modern world has. If this were 200 years ago, we would not be trying to accelerate Afghanistan into the 21st century, rhetorically speaking, in a period of 10 years. One of the greatest problems that I have as a development professional is convincing members of Congress that if you double the amount of money you spend, you'll double the amount of benefit that you get. It doesn't work that way. Um, gender is a perfect example. Um, contrary to popular belief, and I don't want to have an argument about this, but off microphone later we can discuss, contrary to popular belief, Islam does not subjugate women in its practice. Um, however, a number of communities, and Afghanistan is one of them, culturally have done atrocious things to women over the course of centuries. Reversing that is imperative. There is no question at all, Secretary Clinton said it incredibly well, no society can thrive when half its population is subjected to uh, discrimination and inability to perform. We have to be able to include women in the community in Afghanistan. And I fully support that, and I, we put a lot of money and a lot of resources into doing that in some very creative ways. But if they came to me and said, Larry, let's just double the amount of money that we're spending on gender education and we'll make progress twice as fast, I have to explain that's not how it works. Um, you know, my father, bless his heart, is 82 years old in Stone Mountain, Georgia. If I wanted to change fundamentally the way the patriarch of my clan views something, I can't do it no matter how much money you give me in a short period of time. It has to be incremental. And sometimes it takes generations. The greatest hope I have for Afghanistan is college generation, young men and young women both who are taking responsibility for changing the way their culture sees the world. The reason I think it's irreversible is um, the internet. In Afghanistan now, 92% of the population of Afghanistan has access to smartphones, or to cell phone technology. Um, once you connect those communities, you can no longer suppress them the way that you used to be able to. A woman in Afghanistan, in, in rural Afghanistan, a woman in a rural community could very well never see much beyond the mud walls of the home in which she lived, and the compound, the yard, and perhaps the, the well in the community in which she lived. But once you give them a cell phone, and once you allow them to communicate with other women, and once you allow them to see on television, I mean, the biggest, most popular thing in Afghanistan television is India television, which shows women driving cars and women running businesses and women in brightly lit homes with electricity. And Afghans are saying, why can't I have that? So I, anyway, so that was a very wandering answer. I, I think there is a possibility that Afghanistan could fall back into civil war. Um, and there is, depending on who you talk to, the Pashtuns who live both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, there is, a, there is some notion of a Pashtun nation, but that's very weak. I, I, um, I would yield to other experts, Khaled perhaps. I just don't see, um, they call it the balkanization. I don't see the balkanization of Afghanistan happening. I'm much more concerned about it devolving back into civil war, which is one nation arguing about who gets to execute the functions of the state. Yes, you have it right here. We'll get it. <clears throat> question. There was an interesting article yesterday in the paper about the poppy and opium trade and how it's increasing in Afghanistan. And I was wondering, if at all, how you thought affected international development there both in the past 10 to 14 years as well as the tra trajectory in the future? Yeah. Um, thank you for that live grenade on the table here. <laughs> um, conscious of the fact that my bosses are watching this live feed in Washington. Um, Look, I, the, the, uh, this is my personal opinion, so taking off my assistant administrator hat for the moment. We cannot eliminate the trade in undesirable goods and services until we eliminate the market for those goods and services, whether it's opium in Afghanistan or prostitution in Stone Mountain, Georgia. As long as there are people willing to pay for the service or the, or the good, there are going to be people who will find ways to grow it. So the global problem of poppy production is a 
demand problem, not a supply problem. And it's, and it's unfair to the Afghans for us to scapegoat them and say, this is your problem. This is an Afghan. Afghanistan didn't create the poppy problem. Um, they were just, and remember, and I, I tell this to all my young colleagues going to work in Afghanistan, Afghanistans were shrewd traders on the Silk Roads of Asia before the United States was even a gleam in our founding father's eye. So when you go do business with the Afghans, make sure you know what you're doing because they're good at it. Afghans saw a market. They saw that they had um, arid croplands, which didn't grow a lot of other things. Poppy fits with a lot of Afghanistan's cultural needs when they, it, um, when the poppy is being harvested, you can employ your entire family. You can employ your entire village to harvest poppies because you basically, you uh, score the, the, the bud of the plant and then you scrape the sap off with a tongue depressor. It's basically what it amounts to. So it's very labor intensive. It gives everybody a chance to be part of the team and then everybody gets to share in the benefits afterwards. But um, the way that it affects development is for all kinds of reasons, both directed from Congress, but also because it's the right thing to do developmentally, USAID works to develop alternative livelihoods. No one is going to be able to suppress the ability of the Afghans to grow poppy. It's the most rugged, isolated country I've ever been. It's incredibly beautiful, but you could, there just aren't enough policemen in the entire world to stamp out completely growing poppy products. But what we have to do is create alternatives that are um, more lucrative, more stable, and more morally acceptable to the Afghans. Most Afghan farmers, and again, I don't wish to generalize, but most Afghan farmers would rather not grow poppy because they've seen their neighbor become addicted to the product or because they're good Muslims and Muslims don't actually support things like poppy. They do it because they have to feed their families. Afghanistan suffered before the Civil War, and in addition to the Civil War, uh, an incredible blight or drought. And, um, and a famine. And if, if you, if the, again, the patriarch of a clan has got 100 hectares and he needs to plant something to feed his family, and the way the poppy producers and the poppy transitor, uh, traffickers do it is they'll come to Habib Yaqabi and they'll offer him money to buy the seed and they'll offer him security and protection to grow the crop and then they'll buy the crop when they're done. They, they make it really easy to grow poppy. Our job is to make it really easy to grow other things. That's how it's a shape to develop the world. Dr. Scranton, you've got a question here, and then we'll get some others. <coughs> Hold us back. Wait for your mic, please. Let's talk about the pronoun them or they. And coming from your notion of Washington as a zoo, <laughs> where people find it difficult to play well together, I think that's the story of development and political progress in a lot of places. And so what have we learned about uh, the right unit of them that will work politically and economically so that sufficient trust can be built and sufficient profit, however that's defined politically or economically, but also that longer term, yeah, we will work together uh, as long as it takes to make some progress. So what's the right unit for development? We used to think national, yeah. now it's community, and maybe it's a sliding scale, but what have we learned? Well, that's a great question. I actually wrote that down. You've extended my pronouns are important, so thank you. That, that paid for my trip out here. Um, and I have to correct you. I never said that we don't play nicely in Washington. That was you, that was not me. Um, for the record, I did not say that we don't play. I, I, I did make the unfortunate zoo analogy, but the Washington Zoo is a really nice place if you ever wanna visit it. Um, I mean, look, um, what's changed, I think, from my dad's generation, my dad's generation was shaped by World War II, by the Korean War. And then there was this shift to the Vietnam War and, and the, the role of non-state actors in conflict. Um, the Westphalian notion of a state, one of the primary requirements of the state is a monopoly on the use of force. And in large parts of the world, states either don't exist, which we call ungoverned spaces, or the states that do exist don't have the ability to monopolize the use of force. So we can no longer satisfy ourselves or achieve our desired results by engaging at the state level. That's still necessary, but it's no longer sufficient. So to answer your question in some degree, 
When I go to Afghanistan, I meet with the Minister of the Interior. I meet with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We do the state on state, and our State Department handles most of that brilliantly. In the development realm, though, we find that we have to work much, much lower. Ideally, we would provide assistance to the government of Afghanistan, and with great wisdom and foresight, they would then percolate that assistance down to the district and the village level where individual families would receive what, what they need to, um, to make their lives better. That obviously doesn't work. That doesn't work in Stone Mountain, Georgia, so we can't possibly expect it to work in Afghanistan. So from the aid perspective looking at Afghanistan, we have state-to-state -state engagement. We have provincial level, uh, the equivalent of the state of Arkansas engagement. We have district level, which might be a county level set of engagements. And we have engagements all the way down to individual uh, villages. And in fact, even to individual women. We, we do midwife training, for example, that's done at the individual person level, all with the hope that as, um, as the quality of life begins to improve for Afghans at every level of their society, they will see that they have a vested interest in buying into the state as opposed to opting out. If they opt out of the state, then they're prone to being co-opted by, they're, they're vulnerable because the, the, the poppy, uh, tra the drug traffickers can come along and say, the state's not gonna look after you, but we will. Or more commonly in Afghanistan, their clan leader, the, if they're Hazaras, the, one of the Hazara factions, or if they're Uzbek or Tajik, their, their factional leadership. If there's no state providing the, the Westphalian needs of a state, somebody else will step in. And usually they are not um, necessarily wholesome actors. So we have recognized this strata of where we engage, but it's different in every country, and it's even within the country. It's different in Herat out in the west than it is in Badakhshan up in the north. Um, and what makes being a development professional and a diplomat so interesting is knowing when to engage at which level and how. So I guess the, the wrap that answer up, what we've learned is state-to-state -state engagement is no longer adequate. We now have to focus on the entire hierarchy of the nation, not just the state, um, and we have to engage a lot of non-state actors that we didn't used to have to engage. Um, I'm sorry if this question may be a little uh, obnoxiously specific, but uh, it's it's uh, great interest to me. Uh, the the, the Kabul to Kandahar Highway, which was a, a project you know, worked on by the American Corps of Engineers, there, there was a hope for it, I know, when it began that it could end brigandage and sort of tribal vassalage in the country. So I, I guess I'm wondering, are those kind of infrastructure projects, have, have they had an impact on the social fabric of Afghanistan, or have they just had a purely economic factor? That's yeah, you know, I wouldn't denigrate that just a purely economic factor. No, I mean, I, I yeah. Um, and the answer to your question is sometimes. I mean, the, um, there was a famous general who once said that in, in Afghanistan and in the uh, tribal areas of Pakistan, the insurgency begins where the road ends. Um, and so we actually had a program that was called um, Strategic Provincial Highway Program. We identified provinces of Afghanistan that were having problems with the insurgency and USAID put several hundred million dollars into building roads into these provinces that were having these problems with the intent of bringing the benefits of connectedness to these rural communities. There are parts of Afghanistan that when the snows come in September and October, they don't see any outside visitors until the snows melt in May or June. They're snowed in, they're, they're either in the high mountains or they're in the passes and there's no way in or out once the snows come. Those kind of communities are ripe fodder, are, uh, are very ripe fodder for troublemakers and malcontents. Those, are, those areas where those villages live are typically ungoverned spaces because government just can't get in. So by building roads and networks of roads throughout the country, the thinking is that you can, exte you can extend the writ of good governance to the far-flung corners of the country. But that presupposes that you've mastered good governance. And in Afghanistan, that's been a lot more of a challenge than we thought it would be. And I'm just being candid and honest. I'm not saying anything out of school. The capacity, the capacity of the government in Pakistan or the capacity of the government in Colombia, so Colombia is doing, we hope, with a post-FARC period of time now. And they have an educated population. They have the intellectual and human capacity to build governance and to move it out expeditiously to the far corners of the country. 
Afghanistan didn't have that. If you were in Afghanistan during the war years and you could get out, you got out. The people that stayed behind were not typically well educated. They were not well connected. They were not, they, they were living in that well. They, they were looking up and all they saw was a very small piece of the world and the possibilities of it. So they don't have, it's going to take a couple of decades, I think, for Afghanistan to be able to use the networks of roads, the electronic networks of the internet, um, the other interconnectednesses, to use a word badly, the, the other ways of being connected. The government of Afghanistan is trying to master that, but they're not there yet. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But it's always very expensive. I mean, infrastructure is never cheap. And I testify before Congress, which is never, actually it is a lot of fun, but it's never something done lightly. And the hardest questions I get are, you know, Mr. Sampler, you invested $100 million of our tax money into roads in Afghanistan. Flint, Michigan is having horrible problems with the quality of their water today. Why should we spend our money there and not here? It's a hard question, and I'm not going to answer it here. Mr. Grubmeyer, you had a question back here. Hold on, <coughs> man. Wait for the microphone. Yes, could you elaborate on your uh, comments about the importance of technology and development? You did a great job, I think, talking about the cell phone penetration, and with that brings access to markets and maybe telemedicine and other things. But what other technologies like microgrid and water purification systems and things like that are important in development? Yeah, um, so we have, uh, USAID has discovered something in the past five or six years called the Grand Challenges. And what USAID has done, and I'll probably butcher this, but they basically said, we need the smart people of the world to figure out a way to um, make telemedicine small enough and portable enough and sustainable enough that it can be used in rural villages of Afghanistan or in sub-Saharan Africa. And we'll put, $2 million in the pot. If somebody can come up with something that we think is appropriate, here's a $2 million grant to go develop your idea. And then people who have ideas or thoughts or expertise in that area will take the grand challenge. There'll be a competition of ideas, and USAID will pick one or two, or, or, and, and then private sector will actually pick up some of them as well. But it generates a burst of entrepreneurial activity in areas where there had been none before. And that's the only way that well, it's the best way that we've found to capitalize on the fast-moving advances in technology. I mean, I, I used to be pretty smart on computers, but that's when we programmed them with stacks of cards that were punched with holes. When computers moved beyond me, I rely on my son now to help me program my cell phone. So grand challenges are a way that we seize on technology to do innovative, cool things. A couple of examples. There is an entrepreneur who has designed a wood-burning stove that will charge your cell phone. A lot of communities, again, connectedness is vitally important if you want to extend the writ of government. A lot of villages throughout Africa, they have plenty of wood, they have stuff to burn, but they don't have anything to charge their phones. So they've put a little thermocouple into the side of a small wood-burning stove, and when you cook your, your breakfast, the thermocouple will charge your cell phone. Uh, another example that you might have seen on a TV commercial that I think was on one of the Super Bowl commercials, an African himself designed a light that runs off a weight and counterweight system, sort of like a, um, the old grandfather clock where you pulled the chain and you drew the weight up and over 24 hours the weight. They've designed now a solenoid or a generator that's efficient enough to use the same kind of weight system to power a light so that now children can do their homework after dark. Before, children were not doing their homework because they, in, during the day they were in school or they were in the fields doing work, and nighttime was not accessible because they didn't have light. This light now, once you buy the light or once it's bought for you, there's no further cost. There's no kerosene. There's no pollution. The, the light runs itself. Telemedicine is a really big deal with respect to the Syrian refugee crisis. There's an organization that uh, those of you who have a philanthropic interest, I would commend to you. It's called the... Syrian American Medical Society. It's a bunch of Syrian American doctors all practicing in hospitals here in the United States who are trying to project basic medical care, well, all levels of medical care, to Syrians abroad who need it. They may still be in Syria in many cases. They may be in northern Iraq or some other part of that region. Or they may be anywhere on what we call the modern trail of tears from Syria to Europe. Um, and telemedicine is a really big deal for these doctors. 
some of the doctors that are working in hospitals here in the United States have responsible jobs and they can't just go for two years to work in Syria. But what they can do is send a, another doctor who works in Syria and who consults with some of the best uh, practicing doctors in the United States using telemedicine. And it's now portable enough that I'm told it can be done with a notebook computer. So you can literally throw it in a backpack, go to where somebody set up a clinic, depending on what the telemetry is, you know, if you need an x-ray or whatever. But they, they can do basic telemedicine anywhere along the Syrian uh, refugee path to Syrian doctors here in the United States. Um, you mentioned microgrids. That's a big deal in Afghanistan. Here in the United States, we take for granted that we have an interconnected grid. Trivia question. Does anybody know which state in the United States is not part of our electrical grid system? Good guess, actually. Okay, aside from Hawaii and maybe Alaska, um, Texas. Texas is the only state that has, as a policy, opted not to connect themselves to the state grid. But if the, if the generators in Georgia fail for whatever reason, power from other states will flow into Georgia. Afghanistan is just now building their electrical system back, but they have 10 grids. And they don't all work on the same electric, the, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, the energy is not compatible. So microgrids are a big deal. We want to get Afghans on the grid as quickly as possible so that their students can study at night. Afghanistan has tremendous potential at producing uh, fruits and vegetables, but that requires cold storage, and cold storage requires electricity. So we really need to get electricity out to these communities to build businesses and to build human capacity, both. And microgrids are one of the ways that we're doing that. And with respect to microgrids, the most astounding technology has been uh, the tremendous drop in price and increase, increase in quality of solar. It's now possible for us to do solar at the household level if we can figure out the cost, the governance of how you collect to pay for it. But it, uh, in Pakistan and Afghanistan both, we are proposing uh, solar cell fields that are connected to a particular village, and then the village is to be trained on how to maintain and keep the solar field up, and the village has an interest in protecting it. If we run a power line from far in the north to far in the south, all it takes is one angry young man and five pounds of Simitex to, to, to cut the line. But if the power generation is a solar field right in the village vicinity, the village themselves will protect it. At least that's the thinking. Hi, uh, my name is Heather, and I'm a first-year student here at the Clinton School. So my question comes out of legitimate concern with, a, as an individual who is going to graduate soon, and I want to work in international development, and we are bombarded every day with stories of, well, there's ghost schools and ghost children, and um, are U.S. Tax, tax dollars being used adequately? But upon reading those articles, there's little legitimacy there. Um, you look at the USAID website and there are these statistics and they're running this monitoring and evaluation impact and numbers. So my question is, down the line, how is USAID getting the message across, or what is your advice to get the message across to US Americans that are reading these stories? There's the one story that these, this money is going because the president invested $70 million and let girls learn. I think all of us would agree that that's a good investment. But what's your advice for somebody who's about to graduate and go into international development to talk with um, U.S. Americans that what we're doing here is actually legitimate? Yeah, great question. And, um and you need to go run for Congress, because I want you in Congress and some of, some of the people that are asking me questions now. I, I like the way you phrase your question. Now look, I'll, I'll go back to my well analogy. If you're living in a well and all you have is a circle of sky above you and somebody drops a note down that well, you're gonna take it as gospel because it's the only note that you have. When, when you read a story in the press about how we've done something bad, um, check the sources. That's the, the, in other words, the, the, the thing that I say to people all the time, and I have a very active Facebook page, which will probably get me fired someday, but um, on my Facebook page, I constantly will pull these negative stories. I'm a senior official at USAID, but if there's a negative story about my organization, I put it on my Facebook page, and I either admit, because we, we make mistakes. I mean, I know that's anathema for people in government to say, but we do screw things up periodically. Um, 
If we screwed something up, I like to get it out and admit it. This is what we did wrong, but look at what all we did right. And as is usually the case, someone is flogging one of these stories for a particular self-interest. Oftentimes, it's a competing organization. If we gave money to X to go do Y, and we did not give money to A to go do that same thing, A will be the ones who seize on that story and try to get it out there. So there's, there's a certain amount of cutthroat competition among organizations for that. There's also people who take political advantage of the work that we do overseas. But there are some real challenges and some real things that we need to be better at doing. I mean, Afghanistan is USAID's, Afghanistan and Pakistan were the two largest missions in the world. And at one point in time, if you had cut them both in half, we would have been the four largest missions in the world. So we were huge by comparison to any of our other missions. And, and back to the question about how do we decide the right units for development. Um, we need to be learning those units in Afghanistan because we're going to do this again. We don't have the choice of not engaging. We, we are, whether you accept American exceptionalism or not, the rest of the world expects it of us. And we are going to be asked and expected, excuse me, to take a role in these interventions. And we need to do it smart. A guy named Paul Brinkley, so at one point in time, USAID and State Department were not moving as fast as the Defense Department wanted us to on some of our civilian activities. So the Defense Department created for Iraq and then for Afghanistan a group called the Task Force for Business and Stabilization Operations. And the idea was brilliant, and it still is brilliant. The, the military said, we're gonna identify business executives who have tremendous entrepreneurial um, innovation, and we're gonna hire them and put them in this task force. And then we're gonna send them to Afghanistan and say, you guys find opportunities in Afghanistan to do this stuff fast, be entrepreneurial. We know that you're gonna fail six times out of 10, but the four times that you succeed are worth it. In other words, they had a hedge fund mentality to doing development. It was not particularly popular in Congress. Congress wants to give money to the military to do military things, not to do State Department and USAID things. And Paul Brinkley, who was the hedge fund manager, and I think it's fair to say he was a um, interesting guy, was asked by a member of Congress, um, why are you doing this and why isn't USAID doing this work? And his answer is another one of the sayings I have up on my wall. Asking USAID to be entrepreneurial is like asking General Motors to make potato chips. And he's right, and we need to fix that. And the we here in this case is not me, it's not USAID. We, the United States government, the executive needs to propose changes and the legislature needs to then legislate changes that allows the we of the United States government to be better at how we apply assistance. And 80% of the times when we are not particularly good at applying assistance, a large part of the reason is because of the underlying regulations and rules that trace back to the Foreign Assistance Act in the 1960s. That, that it's just never been rewritten. It's just been constantly tweaked. So we're constrained in ways that make it hard to be as successful as we would like. But again, I don't mean to dodge the question. We do actually screw up sometime. And I think the thing that we need to do and that you as a young professional needs to be able to do is to say with pride, that was a mistake. We won't make it again but look at the things that we actually did accomplish. Listen, I encourage others who have more questions and want to visit with Larry to come talk to him uh, uh, as we conclude. But Larry, thank you very much for this very uh, interesting, informative, and enlightening program. And thank you for being with us at the Clinton School.